joined now by one of the few people who have worked both sides of the camera and on the same Doctor Who story. So I would like to introduce supporting artist and assistant script editor, Robin Squire. How are you? Very well, thank you, Alex. Good, and you keep yourself busy? Always busy, always good to be busy. Otherwise I'd, I'd be far too lazy, I, I would never do anything at all. No. Oh, glad to hear it. And uh, I think one occasion, particularly in terms of television, when you were very busy, would have been your first encounter with Doctor Who. As I say, you were both sides of the camera for that. That must have given you a very unique experience of the whole production. Well, I was in the Doctor Who office uh, um, in Shepherd's Bush when the scripts came in. And the one I worked on was uh, Spearhead from Space. Um, and that was a very interesting uh, production. It happened in 1969 when everything was in the process of changing and they were coming out of black and white into colour, um, which I think everybody knows now, who knows about this at all, that the studio cameramen went on strike because they, they didn't, they wanted more money, of course, to work these colour machines, and which was the, the greatest bonus we could have been given. And they'd done a few initial shots, um, like the one at uh, John Sanders in Ealing, when the, the, um, the Autons came to life in the shop window and went marching down the high street, zapping people. And they'd also, when I first came into the filming of it, um, was in a, a disused factory in Acton where they, all the autons were there. It, one of the final scenes that actually, uh, on the actual story, um, with, this, with the long metal staircase uh, and um, the doctor um, finding his way into destroying the Nestine's um, little stronghold. Uh, and that's the first time that I came into um, the actual filming. I, I wasn't there in the evening when they did the shop dummies coming to life, but I was there then. Um, and uh, I'm waffling on now, but uh, it, it, all these memories are coming back now because when I, I was standing there and one of the guys, there were a lot of Autons then, uh, uh, extras dressed up as, we'd like to call it Walk-On, Walk-Ons dressed up as um, Autons. And one of them, unfortunately, uh, got a bit of claustrophobia. It, it, it's a, a plastic mask, it's right over your face. And he tore his mask off and he said, I'm sorry, I can't do this. So, um, <clears throat> I was on the set because I was working, I had six months uh, at um, the BBC and I was in the Doctor Who office. That's, that's another story altogether, how did I get there? Um, but there I was anyway, standing in this place uh, at Acton, this disused factory, and one of the, the extras had gone running off in panic and uh, director Derek Martinus was, <laughs> was looking for a, a quick replacement and I happened to be standing there. And the PA, the production assistant, was uh, Peter Grimway, who later became a uh, marvellous director. Uh, and we were, we were mates anyway, because we used to have a drink now and again. And uh, he saw me standing there and he thought, all right, let's give, this, let's give him a bad time, because he said, <laughs> he said, I remember he said, Robin. And he called me over and he said, how would you like to be an Auton? So the next thing was I, was, I was made into an auton by a wonderful makeup lady called uh, Cynthia Goodwin, who um, stuck this mask on me and everything else. And as soon as I, I'd got my mask on, they called a tea break. So I was, I was standing there and I realized, wait a minute, I haven't got a mouth. So I wasn't able to, <laughs> to, have, to have my tea break. And I didn't get my uh, cup of tea until the shooting was over that day. And, uh, I took, I took the mask off. There was no real sort of warning then that you would be playing this part, and I suppose working with what was a very confined mask. Yes, it was. You couldn't see very well. <clears throat> and uh, um, it, no, there was no warning at all. That was it. How, off we go. And um, when they realised that they had to do this all on film, or decided to do it all on film because they couldn't use the studios, and we went to Evesham, it, it was the, the radio training uh, place there. I, it was a very old country house and it was lovely. And we did, we did the filming there. And I went there as the uh, 
unit driver, really. That's a unit, the film unit. And to do that, um, I had to take a BBC driving test incredibly i had my usual license but um because i would be driving some quite high profile people i suppose they thought that they better check out that i i wasn't going to run it into a wall or something so i did this driving test around acton so i'm now an accredited bbc driver incredibly <laughs> doesn't do me much good but that, that was that was one of my roles the other role of course was because i'd already been an auton to do the, the close-up the big close-up stuff um, in the factory was one of them. Uh, chasing after the, uh, if anybody who knows Spearhead from Space will know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't seen Spearhead from Space, I'm talking absolute gibberish. But um, I stepped off the plinth. I had to step off a plinth and step down and then follow. It was a newspaper reporter had in invaded the, this place, was trying to find out what was going on. And I, so I chased off this reporter. And we did that in um, in Ely, in um, Evesham. Um, and we stayed at the Mansion House Hotel. And that was a wonderful experience. Um, you imagine getting up in the morning and going down to breakfast. And opposite you is John Pertwee. And just across there is uh, Nicholas Courtney. And over there is Caroline John. She was the the uh, companion uh, at that time and uh, I used to really probably annoy John quite a lot because he was my hero I, he, I was I was brought up on radio we didn't when we were kids we didn't uh, have television we played in the woods and did stuff like that and as for mobile phones um, that would have no so uh, anyway here, here, here I was um, with this hero of my radio days if you like because I used to watch, um, sorry, listen to things like Waterlog Spa and the Navy Lark, which John Pertwee was in. And he, he had um, he had this character of the postman. I'm not going to try and do the voice, but it doesn't matter what you do as long as you tear them up. Uh, he would talk about letters. Um, and I would get him to do this voice over breakfast. And he didn't mind at all. He was a lovely guy. So yes, we had all that, and uh, that was a, that was a, a most interesting experience. And uh, what more can I say about the Auton? Uh, Derek Martinus more or less let me do what I wanted, um, if you know what I mean. Once he'd said action, and he'd just point him, "I want you to do this and go there and go somewhere else." He left. So when I started staggering, staggering strangely uh, in this strange walk, um, that was my own invention, and he didn't say. He didn't say anything. <laughs> he didn't say, don't do that. How about trying something else? Uh, so it stayed. And I think at the back of my mind was uh, remembering Frankenstein's monster, maybe, possibly. I don't know. It wasn't anything conscious like that. But I didn't think the Auton would walk normally. Um, unless, unless, of course, he was a higher class Auton who impersonated... Uh, um, members of parliament and, and generals and so on and so forth. So it was all, it was the most interesting experience anyway. But who would have thought 50 years on from that, I, I still find it strange, that we'd still be talking about it. We thought it would be shown once and that would be the end of it. But things have changed. Uh, of course, with the, you know, the invention of DVDs, you know, television that was once a one-off is now there for everyone to enjoy. It. So that's, it, it's yes, it is to see these productions. And you can store all your programmes and, and watch them whenever you like. You can record. We, we couldn't even record our programmes then, I don't think. If we were out, we missed the programme. So you mentioned that you were already in the script department on Doctor Who before becoming an Auton. How did you, you find yourself there? Um, I had a book published. Um, how, how it worked was I had a book published uh, by W. H. Allen, uh, and uh, somebody read. It's a long story. I'll, I'll cut to the chase. A chap called Terence Dix got to know about it, and I lived in Hampstead at the time, and he lived just round the corner, as it happened. And we got together. We had a pint down the road at the place where uh, Ruth Ellis shot that shot her lover. 
the Magdala Tavern. We met down there and we, we, uh, we talked about it. He said, how would you like to come into the BBC for six months? And I said, well, I'm, <laughs> all right, I don't mind. And that's how, that's how it started. And uh, I was there as an, a trainee, a trainee script editor. That was the idea of it. Um, and I only did this. I, I did six months. But then um, I left and came back again. I was to the script unit. So I've had quite a checkered career at the BBC, you might say. Um, so that's how, it, that's how it first came about. But as a, a young writer, how supportive were people like Terence, Barry Letts, Trevor Ray? Were they, you know, did they have the time to sort of talk things through with you? The, the one who gave most time for, um, with Derek Sherwin, funnily enough, uh, I, Barry Letts was an amazing man. There were, he was a naval man, and uh, of course, so was John Pertwee. They were, uh, uh, they were great buddies. In uh, I didn't really feel that he was. Um, all that wonderfully supportive. I didn't, he didn't quite know what I was doing there, I don't think. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't mind too much. I didn't expect to stay very much longer than, <laughs> than the amount of time I stayed. Um, but Derek Sherman was very, very nice. She sat me down and this is how you do and, she, and, and took me through the scripts and so on, because I'd never written the script in my life. Um, I'd only ever done the novel. And of course, everything is enormously different. Uh, and he told me about dialogue and that sort of thing. How pe the patterns of speech when people, when people are talking, they don't talk in great wadges of speech, do they? they? It's a lot of toing and froing, and all this fairly basic stuff. But if you if you haven't thought about it before, um, you're learning. And he was he was very good with that. And Terence um, was also very good. Um, I, I thought maybe he'd give me one of these books to write, the Doctor Who books to write, because I, I came in as a writer, as, as, as a, a, a book writer. But he asked to borrow, I had a book called Who's Who and What's What in Publishing, which gave you all kinds of tips and so on. And he borrowed that from me, and I never, I never saw it again. Uh, God bless you, sir. Um, he was a great guy. And we used to, at the end of the, the day, I used, to, I used to turn up in an old van, um, which the BBC didn't like very much, so I parked it around the corner. Um, and Terence and I, and sometimes a chap called Trevor Ray, also worked in the Doctor Who, Who office then at that time on Shepherd's Bush Green. And he used to join me too. And we'd drive up to Hampstead, where we all lived, strangely enough. And um, Trevor Ray was uh, living with a lady called Prunella Ransom. So we used to go there. Um, for a, a glass of beer or something at the end of the day. And Prunella would be there. And I remembered her from uh, far, uh, far From the Madding Crowd, it was called, uh, um, directed by John Schlesinger. And she was there and she was my favorite character, Fanny Robin. And I, I was too shy to say, I thought you were absolutely wonderful. In fact, I asked Terence about it. Should I tell her how much I adored her character, Fanny Robin? And he said, no, you better not. And I was learning all the time. How does one behave? Uh, so I didn't say anything. But I know now she would have loved it if I'd said, hey, you were terrific. Being in the production office, would you have had involvement in the rest of the Doctor Who season? Stories like Salorians, Inferno, Ambassadors of Death? Not really, no. No, they, they didn't really know what to do with me. Once, once, I, once we'd done the uh, Spirit and Space, um, I sat around the office. Um, one, there was a day when uh, Terence said, we're, we're out of ideas. Have you got any ideas, Robin? So I sat down there and I, I sketched out the idea that the lady became Inferno. Um, and I wondered if, he was, if I was going to be asked to write it. But they got to write. Uh, um, Don Horton, I'm trying to remember, a writer came in and, he, and they gave it to him and said, would you like to develop this? And he went away and he did, he did a version of it and he brought it back in. And I remember he showed it to me and I thought, well, that wasn't quite what I had in mind. So he went, he went away again and came back. And anyway, whatever happened at the end of it, this, um, this story, Inferno, which I really liked. I liked the, uh, how, how it came out. Um, so I was ever so slightly involved with that. 
but I wasn't really in, brought into any intense, intensive discussions with the producers or anything. Because I imagine Doctor Who must have been a particularly good training ground for you because it has, in terms of script, it can go anywhere and any time, but also you falling upon model shots, CG, you know, you've got all those elements to play with. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it, Doctor Who, it, it's a great uh, programme to start with. Uh, and the first thing I learned was that you, there's a certain financial uh, limit. You can't have too many sets, for example. You can't have too many characters. You can't have a thousand Silurians um, running over the hill, whatever they do. Uh, so I, I learned a great deal um, on both sides of the camera from that. And just looking at, uh, in the studios, the studio sets that alone, uh, there's only so much space you've got. And uh, if, this all sounds terribly basic, but if, unless you've actually thought about it before, um, it's all quite new. The first set I ever saw was uh, in the old Lime Grove studios. And Terence took me there. The, I think the first day I went to the BBC, he took me around to Lime Grove studios. To the, and there was the old black and white sets. And I thought they looked really grubby. Uh, and and the guess it was there, it was um, Doctor Who number two. We're standing there, um, Patrick Troughton, and he said hello. And uh, of course, he was soon to be superseded by John Pertwee. At that time, when I I went there in July, June or July of 1969, and I think at that time uh, John Pertwee hadn't even been chosen. I don't think so. I'm, I may may have got that wrong. And uh, the uh, uh, Patrick Troughton was just about to leave. So, like I say, everything everything was changing at that time, uh, and uh, I I found it totally fascinating to be on the inside looking out instead of the other way around for a while, at least. As you say, you moved away from television, but you, that wasn't your last encounter with Doctor Who. You returned alongside John Pertwee for The Demons, which was a, a story filmed a lot on location. How was it working with Christopher Barry on that? Yeah, um, Christopher Barry was the director on that. I, I, I was invited to do that, funnily enough, by Peter Grimwade, who was the production assistant. Um, and he said, do you, want to, do you want to be a BBC cameraman for a day? Um, and we're, they put me up in, it was Marlborough. I took the train to Marlborough, put me up in a hotel and went on the site on the downs there at Marlborough. And there was a, a huge aeroplane propeller standing there. And I had no idea what that was about. But what it was, um, when the tomb was opened, this huge wind roars across. And that was the aeroplane propeller. Once they got that going, it was a full-size aeroplane propeller standing right there by the tomb. So when they got that going, it was a huge wind, and it really did blow us, <laughs> blow us away. It was an amazing, quite amazing. And I, I was standing there pretending to be a, a cameraman, and I got blow, blown away with it all too. And during that time, I reunited, you might say, with John Pertwee. He was a lovely guy. We used to have a drink in the BBC club. I was living some kind of dream, like a dream world. And he'd tell me about his brother, Michael Pertwee, who was a, a playwright and all the rest of it. And he, he, was, he was a lovely man. Uh, and he let me drive Bessie for a little, for a short run, that little yellow car. And uh, also, earlier, he'd let me, he'd let me drive his um, very uh, fabulous, low-slung racing car. And he was very into cars, was John. I read somewhere that he began life on the wall of death. So he was quite a character, riding a motorbike on the wall of death. I, I'd heard that, and uh, apparently that is so. So he was um, quite a devil-may-care sort of chap. So it was yeah. more through Peter Grimwade, really, that you continued to have some contact with Doctor Who? I'd say, well, Peter Grimwade stayed um, on staff, and he wanted to be a director. So he trained to be a director, and, and we, we stayed drinking partners. When I'd left the BBC, we'd meet up in his pub at um, Little Venice, uh, and poor Peter, he, he, he died sadly terribly young, but he, he did the director's course. And once he'd done the director's course, uh, he became, had to become freelance. So 
Peter suddenly he had his um, his salary was no longer there coming in every year. so he had had to find work and while that was happening he was beginning to get ill and I won't go into it all but it was terribly sad but, um, he was a wonderful talent and the, the one I remember that Peter directed was especially was Logopolis because Tom Baker was on that one and, and Tom was a marvelous fellow and I I brought my little daughter to see I. I to, to see the, I'd, I'd been in it that day, so Tom knew who I was, and uh, and that evening, it was in the evening. I brought my daughter and a little school friend. They were about eight years old, and I took them down onto the studio floor, just in time to hear Tom having really sort of sounding off in fury at, on the set and bawling everybody out. And he came storming off the set and came storming down towards me, standing here there with the, these two little girls. And he stopped and his brow cleared completely and a big smile came on his face and he, he went down in his haunches and he said, hello, how are you, how are you? And, and anyway, he talked to the girls uh, and uh, he said, to, there's a terrified looking lady with him, the PA, whatever she had, the uh, assistant, whatever she was. Uh, she was trembling with, with fright at his fury of a few minutes before and he said, he said to her, go and get me a couple of photographs from my dressing room. I'm going to give these young ladies a, a, a signed autograph. And uh, so she did. She, she shot off and came back again and he signed it and gave them one of these two. My, my daughter still has it very proudly. Signed by, with her name and Tom Baker. So he was another, another wonderful fellow. Um, what with him and John Bertie, I was very lucky. I didn't really know the other doctors. I didn't, I didn't meet um, Sylvester McCoy and the, uh, um, Peter Davison and so on and so on and so on. Um, so I can't, I have no, nothing to say, <laughs> say about them. But th those were my heroes, uh, John and, and Tom. And did it feel like the same show when you came back to it alongside Tom? Because you also worked on Full Circle, again directed by Peter Greenway. Yes, and I mean, you, all I knew was it was Doctor Who and it didn't have anything special about it that said this is Doctor Who. Um, so, yeah, as far as I was concerned, it was the same show and just, just went through my... I wasn't doing anything wonderful, but I was, but I was contributing in a very small way, that's how I think of it, uh, to what has now become a legend. And which, um, if Peter was alive today, he'd be de delighted to see that people are still watching watching the stuff that he produced. And he, I think he invented the character of Adric, for example, and, and this sort of thing. Uh, we would never have dreamed that it would have gone, <laughs> gone this far, 50 years down the line. And uh, knowing Peter socially, uh, how was it to be on set and working alongside him professionally? Oh, completely different. And we didn't, didn't, we didn't even look at each other. And he, had, he always had his headphones on and, and, um, and uh, running around. No, absolutely. Uh, it was only kind of, um, if, if he had to speak to me for some reason uh, in, in the pursuit of a, a scene, he would do so. But other than that, that was it. Um, so that's right, that's how it goes. And as you touched upon, you, you started at BBC having written a book and you sort of moved away from television to continue writing a number of books and screenplays and also a theatre production. How, how different is it to write a book as opposed to a script? It, you've got a lot more freedom, I, I believe. Uh, um, you know that nobody else is going to have a go at it. Um, I think writing a book is the, is the, is, is the greatest freedom. If I, I write a screenplay, uh, or a television play, somebody else is going to have a go. You've got a script editor for a start. The television had a script editor sitting there whose sole job was to make the script work for the cameras and uh, so on. So in, in a way, if you're writing for television or for feature film, it's never going to be entirely your work. But you write a book, um, it's just you, you and you. you. You've got to get it right for yourself. And when it's as right as it can be, it should work. And if it's not ever going to work, then you throw it away. You do say, well, I've, I've tried everything. Nobody wants to know. Let it be.
and are you working on anything at the moment? Yeah, I am. I am. I've formed um, what might be called a triumvirate with a media lawyer and a film producer, and we call ourselves the Three Musketeers. And we we've taken one of my screenplays, which I wrote a long time ago, but have up upgraded and updated, set in World War II, um, and we are going to get it made. And at the moment, it's, it's um, in front of several directors who are looking at it. And the plan is to get it made sometime next year. And I've also written the first, uh, the first what I hope is the first of a, a series of books about a psychic detective. And that is, um, that keep, keeps me occupied in this lockdown situation. Um, and that's where we are at the moment. Your website has got details about all of your books and various projects that you've been involved with over the years. Yeah, there's always something else to do, though. You're waiting for the next one. You want to do the, you want to do something else now, and there's never a time when you think, right? Isn't it marvelous? Let's um, let's stop it there. There's always something else you want to do. <laughs> Is there any particular genre that you'd like to explore that you haven't, or perhaps in a different way? I think with this uh, boy, um, not a boy detective. He's, he looks seventeen. He's actually 150. Don't even ask. But uh, it's, I'm interested in, n not in a weird way, but in the occult and in, 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 in things of the spirit uh, and clairvoyancy and uh, healing, spiritual healing, all that sort of stuff. I think uh, there's room somewhere for a character who can do all these things in an entertaining kind of way, put into a story. Um, um, things drop in through the interdimensional gateway called a ports, for example. And you hear stories of extraordinary stories, such as um, the, the Times newspaper from 1888 drops through on, onto your floor and, and you can still smell the, it's just come off the printing press. I'm not making this up. These are things that actually happen and, and they fascinate me. And I'm wondering, um, what it's all about, because there's something going on there which I don't understand, nobody understands, but it's, it is happening, and that's what intrigues me, and I think this is where I'm going now with the, this, this character, that he can do all these things, uh, and that if, if it's spirit possession, for example, one spirit taking over a human being, that kind of stuff, um, why not make it into a story um, and see where it goes to? It may not go anywhere, but it, on the other hand, on the other hand, it might um, just take on. We just don't know. Well, on the note of projects still to come and in development, I think it's an opportune time to say thank you very much for your time, Robin. It's been lovely to talk to you about some of your work. Thank you, Alex. It's very gracious. Thank you very much indeed.